Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, the first in our series of equity on in our series on equity in education. I'm Catherine Burke, president of the board of the Brookline Education and Foundation. The BEF is a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving Brookline's commitment to excellence in public education. We've been promoting excellence and innovation in Brookline schools, pre-K through grade 12, since our founding in 1981 by offering grants to all educators for professional development. As our panelists and any other Brookline teachers and administrators watching here tonight know, we at the BEF meet teachers where they are in terms of professional development they wish to undertake. We are always impressed by the grants they pursue, including the grants you will hear about tonight. The BEF helps Brookline teachers be their best for all Brookline students. When teachers learn and grow professionally, all their students win. Talking about the SEED project grants we have funded is extra special for us this evening, as we have with us the founder of the National SEED Project, Dr. Peggy McIntosh, whose grandchildren attend Brookline Public Schools. Peggy wrote to us, one thing I love about the SEED project in schools is that it attracts educators at all grade levels in all subject areas, and it can serve everyone connected to a school community. Peggy, we are honored to have you here and hope you enjoy hearing about the fruits of your legacy. The BEF is proud to have funded this important work, and we certainly hope that it continues in our district. We thank you all for joining us tonight. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator tonight, BEF board member, Shalini Casita. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. As Catherine mentioned, my name is Shalini Casita, and I'm a Brookline Education Foundation board member and a parent of a BHS student. Um, I'm very excited to host the first in a series of webinars tonight um, on equity in education. Um, but before we get going, I have some housekeeping notes that we just want to go through. This is a Zoom webinar, which may be a little bit of a different format for some of you from a Zoom meeting. In a Zoom webinar, the attendees will not have access to chat. So if any of you are having any difficulties uh, and need attention, you can click on the pa uh, participants uh, box and raise your hand and someone on our end will try and assist you. We will be um, collecting questions uh, throughout the conversation and um, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, if you have any questions as we're going through the discussion, please feel free to enter those questions in and we'll um, address them towards the end of the session after the, the speakers have kind of gone through their discussion. So with the housekeeping underway, we can uh, begin. We are joined today by a group of amazing Brookline educators uh, that were recipients of a BF grant uh, to attend workshops by a national organization called Seeking Equity, uh, Educational Equity and Diversity Project, otherwise known as SEED. And uh, SEED is a peer-led professional development program that creates conversational communities to drive personal, organizational, and societal change towards greater equity and diversity. The BEF uh, has funded six Brookline public educators, school educators uh, to go through this training over the past five years. And we have tonight five of them joining us. Um, they're gonna talk about the, the training that they went through and how their teaching and educational practice has changed for the positive since receiving it. Um, I would like to start by asking each of the panelists um, to introduce themselves and tell us where they, where they teach, as well as what they teach, what, what subject areas they focus on. And then as a follow-up question, um, it would be great for us to understand why you felt, um, why were you interested in applying for the SEED Grant, uh, grant to go through the seed training uh, initially. So I think I'm going to start with Cara, Cara, you first. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, BEF, and, and thank you for all of the people who are attending out there. I'm super excited that people are interested in SEED. It's near and dear to my heart, as it is, I know, for, for all the panelists tonight. Uh, my name is Kara Lopez. I am a BHS uh, and ACE school counselor. Um, I have been at BHS since 2004. Before that, I was at Cambridge Ringe and Latin, uh, where I started in 1999. Sounds like a really long time ago. Um, and actually, it's it, it's at Ringe where uh, my knowledge and my um, my interest in in seed was born. Uh, when I was at Ringe, uh, one of my dear colleagues and dear friends, Donald Burroughs brought seed to Ringe and I left before I had an opportunity to actually do one of Donald's seed seminars. So I got to Brookline and over the years in Brookline, uh, you know, Malcolm can certainly speak to this because Malcolm has been in Brookline forever, but racial tensions were, were bubbling up, bubbling up, bubbling up. And finally in 2015, 2016 school year, it really got to a, to, to a point where I felt like there needed to be something done immediately for our community um, so we could learn and listen to each other and learn from each other. At that point, I reached out to Donald Burroughs and um, we, we discussed it and he gave me fantastic advice and, and essentially laid out for me um, the blueprint for rolling out seed. And his advice was, let's get seed started. Let's start something right now. Uh, let's do, it was January at the time. He said, let's do a six month seed seminar um, and you participate. As, as a participant, you, you be a participant, Kara. And then while you do that, applied it for the new seed leaders uh, training over the summertime. Uh, so we went ahead and did that. And what, another piece of advice Donald gave me was he's like, you need, a, you need a partner. So that didn't take me long to figure out who my partner was gonna be. And that was gonna be the, the great Malcolm Cawthorn, uh, my ride or die. And so, he and I were like, well, how are we gonna pay for this? And that's when the BEF came into play. And we applied for a collaborative grant for the, it was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. Um, and uh, we were so excited to receive the collaborative grant and to be able to go uh, we ended up going to Wisconsin for our training. It was one of the best weeks of my life. Um, it was profound, profound, transformative experience. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about the people I share the world with. And I learned that I have a lot more to learn and that it's an ongoing process. Um, then Malcolm and I started SEED. We ran SEED seminars at Brookline High School for 20 faculty members that following year. And we quickly realized we needed more. And there was uh, a, a desire from our faculty. More people wanted to, to do it. So we really hoped to do two sections the next year. Uh, and that's when we applied for yet another collaborative grant from the BEF and generously uh, and also wisely, I think wanting to fund uh, projects around equity. Uh, funded us again, and that's when uh, Jeanette Sargent and Lindsay Davis were able to, to be trained as C leaders. And the next year, we offered two sections. And every year, there's a wait list. So there's a great, great need and great want to, to do this work. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. That sounds like it it's really developed over the last few years. With that, I think Malcolm might be the next person to kind of answer that question. So Malcolm, if you could just introduce yourself and and it sounds like you and Kara approached this as a partnership, but it would be good to, to understand from your perspective what, what really was kind of compelling about you wanting to go through the, the program as well. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Malcolm Cawthorn. Uh, I'm currently the BHS MECO coordinator. Uh, I've been teaching at Brookline High School since 1998. I'm also a graduate of Brookline Public Schools. And so uh, 
it feels like I've been around longer than I actually have been. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I started teaching social studies in 1998 at Brooklyn High. And um, I've been the micro coordinator since the fall of 2019. Um, so, you know, you know, Kara said everything. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. No, of course, there's uh, it's a personal element, but I, I am always very grateful to Kara um, saying we need to bring seed. And she had actually been saying it for a while before um, really the, the sort of, um, you know, I think the, the mesh point or the turning point history was, was a video, a racist video that got released. And, um, and that kind of sent the school into a tailspin and really got Kara to, you know, become a, a big a big driving force to convince the school to do work with our teachers and um, and uh, bring Donald in, who uh, is certainly somebody I admire, and he was uh, actually one of my facilitators at New Trainers Week. Um, I think the thing about C for me that is that was really appealing is that it, you know, a lot of the work is within yourself and to remind yourself of what's important, to remind yourself that, you know, being a teacher is not easy, working in schools is not easy, and that it is important that no matter what you teach what you do as an occupation within those schools, we actually owe it to our children to be confident ourselves, to teach them about things that will make them better human beings. And that through the seed model only works when you reflect upon yourself. And the reality is that much of my teaching career, I didn't have the time to actually reflect upon myself between grading and everything else and like planning you know, um, and then the life outside of raising a family and I, I never had the time. And so that week was incredibly um, special for me, not just because like, you know, Karen and I were there and we had a chance to think about like how we would do this and bring it to our own community because see, it doesn't dictate how you do it in your community. They give you some parameters and they say, you know, your community, bring what your community needs but it was also the fact that, you know, I was there with 75 to 80 other educators across a wide spectrum. You know, we had uh, teachers from Canada and England all thinking about this um, in this work. Um, and so for me, having that moment to pause and to remember, you know, things about myself as well as to actually put into place and remind myself that, you know, being a teenager is pretty hard. <laughs> and, um, and, to, and to think about how I could be more empathetic to what teenagers are going through, as well as to use a C term, present windows and mirrors for those teenagers um, was, was and has been and will be a very powerful part of my teaching in being an educator in Brookline. And so I'm very grateful to Seed and to the BEF. And um, at that point, Gabe McCormick really walked us through a lot in that grant. And so very grateful to him as well for helping in that moment. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. Um, so now I'm gonna pass it over to um, Julie Boss, uh, just to get a different perspective from an elementary standpoint. And I think one of the things that both you and Kara touched on was kind of going through it and how it was life changing. It would be also maybe useful to understand a little bit and Julie, maybe you can expand on what it looks like when you go through the training for that week. Sure, hi, um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this experience. Um, yes, I, I, you know, I think, for me, the opportunity to do seed was was about an intersection of some personal goals that I had and also recognizing a need to kind of push the collective consciousness of the of the Brookline community from observations of, of um, dynamics and things going on in the schools. Um, and it certainly did fulfill that that as well. So 
In terms of the experience at Seed, um, I was really looking, my, my personal goals were um, to kind of dig more deeply into my own identity and issues and allowing myself. I knew that I needed to take my anti-racist work to a new level um, in terms of being willing to be vulnerable and take risks. And Seed was very much that. The, the week there, you're in this intensive, um, it's a residential program. So you're really living, eating and breathing, literally, um, the Seed work with, with, with folks. And you do kind of lay yourself raw in a lot of ways. Um, I, I would actually love the opportunity to do it again because I feel like it's sort of a, a rejuvenating experience that infuses you in, in the work. Um, on a daily basis, but I really did learn so much um, about myself. And as, as Malcolm says, as, as, as educators and just busy people in, in life, we don't often get the opportunity to do that. But to do it in this incredibly nurturing way, I think is, is really powerful. And I think that that's a lot of the power of SEED is that it doesn't shy away from doing the hard work. And it, there's just something sort of magically um, nurturing and, and you know, up, upholding about the work. I think one of the big ideas is, you know, you have a responsibility to, to do this work. Um, and at the same time, it's very, you know, there's a lot of grace involved so that there is that, um, you don't, it's not about guilt, it's about responsibility for, for making the world a better place and a more just and inclusive place. And so, um, that was incredibly powerful and, and I'll value that always. And um, also just really appreciate the BEF both for that, giving me the opportunity to do that on a personal level. And then also, like I said, the intersection with feeling like um, I can play a part in uplifting the Brookline community and, and um, working toward making Brookline more inclusive and a more um, human place for, for all of our students. Great, thank you. Um, so the next person was is Lindsay Davis. Uh, we'll go back to the high school. And Lizzie, if you could just introduce yourself and I've already sure. said you're at the high school and Absolutely. what you do. Yep, yeah. I'm a high school world language teacher. I teach Spanish. Um, I signed up for SEED first as a participant. So Kara and Malcolm were my SEED facilitators. And I did so because the high school has two days. One is asking for courage and it's a day of assemblies and events all connected to um, racial identity, and the other is um, day of dialogue about gender and sexuality identity. And both those days have a block of assemblies called telling your stories where students tell their story. And I realized on both those days very early on in coming to the high school, how ignorant I was to my own identity and how self-aware and magical like the students were. And that my ignorance of my own identity was negatively impacting my curriculum and instruction. Um, and the students are demanding better. And so it seemed when Kara offered seed to be a part of a group of teachers understanding themselves better, it seemed exactly like what students were demanding of teachers and of our school. Um, so I signed up initially as a participant and then I signed up to do the training because I felt like as a teacher, I could diffuse tension um, but I couldn't hold space or create space, um, both for challenging conversations, but also for like celebrations of identity. I think I was very focused on like being a Spanish teacher and didn't realize the humanness of how important it was to understand like how, who I am shows up in the curriculum that I create, um, and the way in which I interact with students. So, um, signing up for the training was was huge so that now I feel like I can both hold space and not shy away from it, which is contributing to the racism and the sexism and all the isms, um, but hold space and then also create space for students. Um, so very grateful. That's a, that's a really interesting perspective of how, how the students have affected your perception and, and how you've kind of gone about this process. So our last panelist is uh, Hillary Rosenzweig. And uh, Hillary, if you wanna just introduce yourself and let us know where you teach and why you uh, were interested in going through the program. 
Absolutely. Thank you very much again for being able to be here. Seed is just um, a deep passion of mine and I'm thankful to Julie Boss who um, asked me to be her partner in this journey and worked together in writing our collaborative grant. I think um, Julie and I uh, push each other very much in our work and um, I wouldn't be where I am today with the seed work without Julie. So I first want to um, acknowledge that. And I think for me, it's a journey. I am uh, Hillary Rosenzweig, like I said, and I'm a math specialist and I work at the Lincoln School. I've been in Brookline for 30 years. I think I'm the oldest long veteran on the panel. And I began my journey in Brookline um, as a very young white girl from suburbs of Connecticut. Um, and I was hired to work in the most diverse school in Brookline. And I knew that my responsibility was to take my family value of acceptance and understanding to greater depths. And, you know, it was one idea to want to embrace diversity. It was another to truly understand diversity and its impact on identity and academic success. So it's been a career journey for me that I absorbed everything Brookline had to offer over the years. They had a program called EMI, Empowering Multicultural Initiatives, I think was funded by the BAF at one time. And then I worked deeply at Lincoln, where we did a lot of racial identity professional development together as a, a community, where we unpacked white privilege uh, and you know, what our impact was on institutional racism. But I quickly learned that that was all well and good, but there was deeper learning that I needed to do. I really needed to dig deep into my own personal biases and how what I did in my role was impacted those around me and impacted the learning for my students. And so with Julie's encouragement, um, I participated in the SEED seminar, which as Julie said, it's residential and it's a very intense time. I think we were out in Western Mass in a building that was not air conditioned in the hottest heat wave. And I felt that that was just all part of the process of this managing all the different scenarios of what was hard in life and really digging deep into who we were. And you know, really, really pushing myself around my understandings and my boundaries to become an effective ally an accomplice for you know racial justice and to help establish you know anti-racist systems that would promote educational equity for our students and i think the greatest gift was the ability to facilitate um, that i that i gained from seed that i was able to bring back to brookline and julie and i you know modeled our work after the work that the high school so successfully created we collaborated with malcolm and lindsay to create a program that was specifically for K to eight teachers. And we've comp almost completed three years of our seminars. And each year, Julie and I just go deeper and deeper into our own learning and working with people to sort of think about how we can mitigate the barriers our students and colleagues face and how we can work to each other and work with administration to rethink policies that have stemmed from systems of year long of years, years of oppression and offer education that authentically sees each student as their indiv the individual that they are. And I'm just so overwhelmed with what we see happening around us um, from this work and grateful to SEED for what they gave us and to the support of the BEF to be able to put this work into action. Thank you. So um, that, that was really good. Good overview from different perspectives of, of why you all went into it and what you got out of it and the experience. And it sounds uh, very personal, but also very uh, powerful. Um, before we kind of get into some deeper questions on you know, how you've applied uh, what you've learned, I wanted to just step back a little bit and it touches a little bit on some of the areas that you've already talked about as a group. Um, but I wanted to ask what, what in your, from your perspective, does equity and diversity look like to you now that you've gone through the program? Um, and, and, you know, how have you applied it to your daily educational practices? That's, it's a three part question. The, the second part would, was, you know, where do you see room for improvement? as you're going through, because one of you mentioned that it's an ongoing process, it's never done. And um, I'll, I'll let you just uh, open up and maybe 
if one of you want to start, um, we can answer those two questions because I'm interested in just at a broader level understanding kind of how it how you see it applying to Brookline and, and what you do every day. I'm happy to start with that. Um, in terms of, you know, how, how do I define equity? Um, how do I define diversity? You know, equity for me, and, and it's an ongoing kind of shifting and, and thinking about it and reflecting on it, but it really comes down to examining and identifying where there's great need, where the need is. Um, and once that is identified, we need to resource it. That's equity. We can't resource the wants before we resource the needs, right? Like that's like building the top of a pyramid before the, the base is done. It's, it, it's just, and when you, when you resource the needs completely, 100%, everybody benefits. We see this in systems throughout time, throughout the world. Um, so that's what equity looks like for me. And then diversity, the way I, I see diversity is, you know, many differences and that contributing to uh, healthy functioning systems. So you could, you can be talking about diversity and on any, any given level. You know, I think I was talking with my husband earlier today because we both have a, a great interest in gardening and agriculture and biodiversity is, is a great example that I think is very concrete. Biodiversity is critical. Uh, lots of different uh, organisms in, a, in an ecosystem are really, really important for its healthy functioning. And that's the same thing with social systems. We need lots and lots and lots of differences, lots of different identities to create a healthy, vibrant social system. And when we have few, uh, it's not gonna be healthy. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be very functioning. So um, those are my thoughts on, on equity and diversity. And, and I'll, I'll step back. I've got lots more to, to say about where we can, we can work on, a, on equity. And anyone who knows me knows I've got a lot of opinions on that. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll go back to the question around um, how do you apply this in your daily work? And, and maybe one of the other panelists can respond to that. Um, question. I can, I can go next. I would say before seed, I think I probably for equity, um, diversity and inclusion, I'd be like, look at my diverse bookshelf. Look at all the countries I have to, like all the Spanish speaking countries I have in my Spanish curriculum. And I think I was like checking off boxes and surface level trying to be like a good person um, and include diverse images in curriculum. And now I think after seed, I can pause and before making curriculum think about like, what about me as like a white cisgendered female heterosexual plays a role in what I'm choosing to teach. And now while I'm teaching, uh, like if there's a romance scene between a man and a woman in something we're doing in class, I can pause and be like, Let's remember there are also romances between two men, romances between two women. And I can more easily see who's not being celebrated and who's not in the picture. And I can create space for that. Um, and I think it's including more student voice in work and being like, hold on, is what just happened between us, was that okay? And getting curious about students and Kara was talking about this a lot um, as my seed teacher, um, like all the things I don't know about kids. So the student maybe before seed would be like, oh, that student always comes in late, like what's their problem? But now after seed, I can be like, what about me and my class makes them not want to come on time? And what else about that student might be happening to not allow them to get in on time. Um, so I think there's a curiosity element. There's like an accountability element of my own identity. And then now also too, um, instead of surface level, now as, as like a regular Spanish teacher, I'm very interested in like the policy of at BHS and like what's, what's going on with equity in our grading and placement. And like, if you look at a AP class, like 
What's the equity, diversity, and inclusion going on there? So I think it took me from just like looking at my own classroom and my bookshelf to recognizing like the choices I made in creating that bookshelf and 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 outside the walls of my own classroom. That's, that's very well explained. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, anyone else want to chime in on how it's affected their daily work and how they apply um, themselves before we move on? Malcolm? I'll just add one quick point yeah. that I think um, something seed reinforced in me that, you know, I think a lot of times with equity and diversity, um, we accept the minimum. And SEED has challenged me to think, you know, true equity is making sure everyone is truly in a place where they feel they can thrive and, and do all and have access to everything. And so, you know, I think about that, like, you know, I just found out next year I have a student who's visually impaired. And so what, you know, my immediate thing is not like, how can this student just get to their classes? I need to think about what does the student need to really access education so that that student can thrive at Brookline High School? Um, and, and so it's, it's looking at, you know, people talk about systems and policies and things like that, but it, it, it is to challenge, you know, what is the bare minimum? I mean, for a long time, I was, uh, you know, the only black teacher, or I shouldn't say for a long time, at different times, I've been the only black teacher in the social studies department. And, and that was often dubbed as okay because other departments had none. But that is a really minimalist perspective of diversity. Right. And so, you know, it wasn't OK for the social studies department to pat themselves on the back and say, look how good we are, because we have one. Right. And so I think, you know, that kind of um, outlook to always be challenging, you know, I think, you know, the famous quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg when they asked, when will it be OK, when will it be enough women on the Supreme Court? And she said, when they're not. Right. Like. Like that's, that's what it needs to be. Like we need to challenge and not be satisfied with the bare minimum. Um, and that's, that's the thing I've really felt challenged by through the work of SEED and, and then looking at my own school. That's great, thank you. Um, and so go ahead, Julie. I was just gonna add from a, um, you know, perspective of as a, as a K to five math specialists that I think a lot more about whose voices is, are elevated as being good at math and what that means to be good at math. And, um, you know, just getting a diversity of ideas in the classroom and being really conscious of um, opportunities that exist within the classroom who, who we think, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit repeating myself here, but I think that that notion of what we tend to think of as being, what does it mean to be good at math and recognizing all kinds of diversity of, of thought and ideas and, um, you know, shifting the dynamics in, 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 even in math class in terms of encompassing everybody's humanity. And I think a lot more about opportunity gaps that can exist within one classroom in terms of who has the opportunity to speak and who is listened to. I think I would, I was, Julie just beat me to what I was about to start talking about too, which is um, we're needing to shift looking at students from an asset base as opposed to a deficit base. Um, I sit on the child study team where it's a place where teachers come to think and reflect about students. And far too often we're thinking about what intervention does that child need? And when we really start to think about the equity of a student, we're thinking about what does that child bring and what, how can we elevate what that child knows to help them connect to what's going on in their classroom? And how can we educate teachers about looking at what the skills the student brings to the table? Um, I think that we are still in a, a place where our students are co of color are overpopulating our special education programs and are being uh, referred to quickly as opposed to be thinking about what skills they have and how can we um, help further their education without it necessarily needing to be um, special educations to where they receive their education. Okay, great. I had one other question that all of you also talked about around the structure of SEED and how the program runs and it, um, 
it looks like Cara and you have been, uh, Malcolm have kind of been running some of the programs. Can you talk a little bit about the, the structure of the program and how, what the ripple effect is? I think one of the discussions we were having prior to the, to the going live was just the fact that this model, and I think it was you, Julie, who talked about it earlier, was just that it's, it, this model has a ripple effect and it's a very homegrown kind of structure. Can you expand on that a little bit so we can understand kind of how the program works? Because it's not, it doesn't sound like a traditional program, training program. Yeah, you know, it, it's when I was initially talking with Donald Burroughs, uh, one of the, the seed trainers, um, he said to me, don't, don't even worry about it. We're going to do this first round and it's going to catch fire because the participants are going to talk about it with their colleagues. Um, and he, he was, he hit the nail on the head. And a lot of times uh, I think administration tries to think about, uh, you know, in terms of equity and equity work, mandating it. And we've been in conversations with administration and they're like, you know, should we, man should we mandate everybody do seed? And all of the seed leaders at the high school are like, no, 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 that's, that's we don't believe in that. We don't believe you're, you need to. Um, so we have said, you know, if you're gonna mandate something, you, you know, you can maybe mandate something, you gotta do something and seed can be on the menu. And we have great, great um, confidence that people are going to pick seed and and sh and sure enough with that with not even mandating people do it people were signing up and we and we had wait lists um, I think one of the things too that we got creative about is is incentivizing it too right so uh, we worked with Gabe McCormick and Fitchburg State and we were able to get people, uh, teachers, faculty, to be able to earn credit for college credit, uh, master's plus credit for uh, participating. And, and that, that was a really big deal. Um, you didn't have, have to do that, but it, it was an option. And then finally, I think one of the most important things <laughs> And I have been like, so it's like my sticky point is the food. You have to feed people. This is really hard, exhausting work. And your brain and your heart needs to be fed. And breaking bread together is not a small thing. It is, it creates community. It creates bond. Um, it is incredibly important. So uh, there has to be food and not chips not pretzels like we need i know Lindsay and malcolm are looking at me right now like she is not even playing she brings things. so it's got to be real, real good food when covid right. is over hopefully we'll be in that, right. in that place right. again right malcolm yeah. did you want to add to yeah, that yeah I, I do and um i think uh, probably earlier julie should talk julie should talk because it's probably similar in the elementary schools but one of the things at brookline high school i think you know, I mean, we all follow sort of the protocol that SEED sits out. You know, it's supposed to be a total of 30 hours over the course of a year. So for us, it's three hours a month. Um, you know, after school, people dedicate. And it's one of the things where people talk about, like, they get there after school and they're like, you know, the rat race of the day. And then by the time we leave, which is late to leave a school building, you know, a lot of times we don't leave. You know, we don't end until close to 630. And then, you know, Lindsay and I probably and Darren and I would be there till seven cleaning up. But everybody talks about feeling so much lighter and better after it. I, I, the two things I really appreciate, uh, you know, in that and learning the multitude of different um, ways to identify and see the world is, um, you know, seed leaders become resources. So long after, you know, you know, the groups we did in 2016, I get emails, I get people to stop by my office. Hey, you know, Malcolm, this happened in class. Can we talk this out? Can we do this? I think the other thing is it really builds community in our building. So we've had nurses take seed, um, you know, uh, steps to success core, uh, you know, college counselors, coordinators, our headmaster, head of school took seed, guidance counselors, people from different departments. And it's really easy at Brooklyn High School to get into silos and, and, and not even get to know people from other departments. You know, uh, you know, the last sort of official Lindsay that, you know, we had two um, 
special education teachers who work in self-contained classrooms with some of our most needy kids. They'll be caring for Brookline kids until their 22nd birthday. But because of that work, they rarely get out and meet other people and they could be in community with all of us. And, um, and that builds community in our school building to where you, know, you see that person, you actually know who they are, you've gone through this process. Um, and in that way, I've never really experienced anything like that um, at, at any of the schools I've taught at, where, where you, know, you really got to know somebody that perhaps you could have been in that building for 20, 30 years and never truly had a conversation or knew more than their name. And so that's, that's the thing that really sticks with me. So it sounds like there's an integration aspect of this that, that you didn't expect to get out of it, where you have different groups uh, that work with different needs. Well, I think we looked for it. Like, like yeah. you know, I remember, you know, when I was facilitating with Kara and with Lindsay, we would look for it. We would, you know, we would try and pick people across social workers, you know, look at the dynamics of our groups. You know, do we have enough folks of color? Do we have, you know, good balance, you know, between gender identity and stuff? We would look for all that. Um, but I, I don't think I really realized the impact it would have upon me until I sat in that space. Great. Um, we, so I'm going to open up the floor for any of the attendees that want to ask questions. Uh, you can add a question to the Q&A um, box. We have a question here for, uh, for Hillary that you mentioned special ed has dis disproportionately more kids of color. Can you talk a little bit about if and how SEED has helped with, with that aspect? I think it's a slow process. I think that um, in the elementary level, K to eight, uh, Julie and I only really worked through, uh, this is our third round of seminars. And we have had a, roughly about 20 teachers in each seminar. And as we educate our teachers who have gone through the SEED training with us, they're bringing back to their schools new ways to be thinking about students and thinking about anti-racist education. And in doing that, it's helping teachers build more skill in how we reach and, and connect with students. So it's not happening as fast as we would like it to, but it's, it's an evolution. And I think our child study teams are getting better by um, talking about and thinking about students from an asset base and looking at other ways to support students before we then just say, let's put them through for evaluation for special education. So I think it's slowly having an impact. I think there's a lot of room for growth with that. Great, we have another question that's just come in. Um, can you talk about the length of the seed meetings, the frequency, how many are in a group? I think just to get a sense of the visual aspect, it's, it's still a little abstract and hard to imagine how the structure works. So if, if you could also maybe, Lindsay, if you wanna take that one and explain. Sure, so at the high school, um, it's three hours once a month um, and we offered a group immediately after, well, after school, so we did a 3.30 to 6.30 once a month, and then Kara um, and Jeanette were doing a Saturday morning seed group. So three hours for once a month. Um, we did try to keep the groups to 20, and that's because there is a specific protocol that you learn through the training. Um, time keeping and time protocols are used heavily. Um, so 20 is the cutoff, Malcolm and I, sometimes took it a little to 25. Our backbone is a little less. Uh, we had larger groups sometimes, um, but three hours, once a month, and groups of 20-ish. I think the, I saw in the, the, the question, um, seat is the only meeting I really wanna go to. And I think because it is created within the school and that community that Malcolm said, you know, you can go to one PD day, you can go to an author talk and be like inspired and that's like, wow, but working with your colleagues and being vulnerable with your colleagues and your administrators, I, I, like almost all of the curriculum coordinators have taken seed is um, it's a really, yeah, it's a community building experience. Um, so um, thank you for that. Um, we actually have a few uh, people from the Cambridge School District here today and that were interested in learning more about seed. So we have someone, from the Cambridge Public Schools, and they're wondering if uh, you would recommend 
that they wait till COVID is under control before uh, embarking on a program like this. And I guess the, that that goes into the level of interaction that you think is is needed. And I think Julie, maybe you can kick off and then we'll ask Cara the, that question. Sure. Um, I mean, I'd love to talk about this because we really debated what we were going to do this year um, for elementary and we um, ended up recruiting. We started with 15 people and we're down to 13. A couple of folks had to drop out, but we're doing it fully remotely. And, um, you know, we, we asked a lot of questions about community building and, um, you know, we've been trying to be really responsive to folks' needs. And it, I would say in some ways that this group that we're uh, facilitating this year, in, in a lot of ways, they're just surpassing, uh, like Hillary and I at the end of a session are just like, we just sit there with our mouth hanging up, open, blown away by the ability for people to really dig deeply in this work on a Zoom. Um, and the connections that folks are making have been incredibly deep um, and so I would say, I would say, don't wait, you know, the time, I mean, I think you've got time to do it in person in other years. And if I think it's better to start now than to not, to not start yet. Um, and we've had a lot of success. It's, it's, um, you'd be mindful of community and the people that you get are people who really want to be there. And in terms of the training, if you were, you know, talking about attending the new seat, the the new leaders week um, for the training, I think I would I would guess that the same would be true. Thank you, Carrie. You want to add to that? I actually am going to kick it to Malcolm because Malcolm's actually one of the seed uh, leader trainers. That's right. During during the week, and he's he has the experience of doing it remotely. Um, but I do just want to say that. Uh, one of the amazing things about SEED is that there is a community that is there at any given moment. It could be midnight and I can get online and I can type in, I need help with this you know, seminar or planning or who has ideas or this is what I'm struggling with. Um, and, and you'll just get so much of a response, whether it's from the seed leaders or from other other uh, seed leaders who have been trained. Um, there's, you know, I just went to office hours the other day with the um, the directors, the co-directors of seed. So there's just always people there. And then in terms of being in person, there's also something called reseed, which Malcolm and I were really grateful uh, and able to do where, uh, I don't know what was it, Malcolm, a couple of years after we did our initial training, we went to a reseed and in person. Um, and, you know, kind of, it's kind of like next level, you kind of taking your initial, you know, training to the next level. Um, and so there's always that opportunity too down the line when you'll be able to do it in person. So um, I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to start it, but Malcolm can really talk about the remote way of, of doing it, um, kind of like Julie did. Malcolm? Yeah, so I, I would definitely suggest not waiting uh, if you have that capability. Do you uh, want to just explain to the audience your role and the fact that you're on the national um, um, okay. staff, I, that yeah, you're coming um, at it from your perspective as a, as, a, as a trainer? I mean, so I do facilitate at Brooklyn High School, um, but I, I also uh, two years ago joined um, the, the national uh, C team to um, New Trainers Week. And so um, my first time two summers ago, I was out in California, uh, training folks. And then this last summer it was, it was virtual. Um, and, um, we were all very worried about what that would mean because, um, I think as, uh, Julie and Hillary were mentioning most profoundly, like, you know, the idea that you are like Kara and I were in like a dorm. Like, I mean, like, like it was true, like community, like, you know, almost sort of throwback in a way, uh, you know, with a roommate I didn't know who was from like Chicago area, like, you know, it was, it was really kind of a throwback in that way. Um, and this past summer virtually was, was an incredibly powerful experience for me. I mean, and, and, and really made connections where I still talk to the people who not just were in, um, 
the group I facilitated, but also, um, you know, people outside of that. I mean, to give you an example of how close we got, one of the people I facilitated with invited me to be on a panel for Black History Month at his community college in Minnesota, which I never could have done, except for now we have Zoom, so I could do it. Uh, but, you know, I get texts and all of this stuff. But I, I think, too, um, while it's not the same, it doesn't mean it's lesser. And I think that's really key. And, and we found that out last year when COVID hit. It was it actually hit a week before Lindsay and I were supposed to hold a seed session. And um, the, the participants were like, we need this space. Like, we're in a pandemic. We need the space. And so um, I, I would definitely suggest go ahead and do it. Um, it'll be worth it. Um, as people are talking, seed takes... I've never worked in an organization that takes everything into account. Great. There's no stone unturned. I, I've just never been in another organization Sounds like powerful. that. So one, uh, a question we have here is uh, a general question. Obviously you're all tenured educators and have gone through different types of professional development. Can, um, can maybe we can start with Hillary. Can you, talk a little bit about how SEED is different from other professional development programs that you've gone through? Absolutely, SEED is, is different primarily for the intensity of it and the, the, the amount of commitment and time that you do with SEED. Other professional development programs, it could be a day program, it could be you know an hour of a program here or a little piece here, and then you are sort of left on your own to sort of think things through and problem solve and try new, new ideas out. With SEED, it's a process. It's you begin together in September, you meet monthly. It's a three hour meeting that you participate in. You're actively engaged in. You are doing readings and prep work and reflections outside in between sessions. You have a cohort of people who you speak to throughout the process and it's an evolution. You start in one aspect of yourself entering in September and you are a completely different person when you leave in June and you have worked within this community to reflect and think and challenge yourself, it, it's very different. You are not the same person when you come out. And as a facilitator, I think Julie and I meet, we run a three hour session once a month. We meet maybe possibly nine, a minimum of nine hours prior to each session. And we are you know, reflecting and thinking about current material that will help people think about the content in a relevant way. And our learning goes deeper every time we teach a session. So it's not just professional development for those who are taking it for credit, but it's also professional development for us as facilitators as well. And it's ongoing. Great. Um, I have a question here around um, um, Leaders Week and what it is and who it's for. I think that's a follow up from a comment that Malcolm made earlier about going through Leaders Week. Well, I mean, I think anybody can speak to it. I mean, I, and, and I want to be really clear. So I, I don't, I, I work to facilitate and, and work through uh, uh, New Leaders Week or New Trainers Week, but I like, like I'm not part of the selection process. Like I don't read applications or anything like that. Um, that's with the directors and they do that and uh, everything else. So I, I want to be clear about that. I would say, you know, the one thing about seed, particularly as, as I've grown within the organization is it's really for any institution that wants to think about itself through um, seeking, you know, equity and diversity. I mean, you know, uh, you, know it, you know, starting through schools is that, but, you know, when I was training in California, there were police officers, there were people connected to community organizations. Um, there were even some people like, you know, they were usually like education think tanks, but they were nonprofit organizations that were doing this work. And so, um, you know, uh, and, and with that, like, there were also people from a wide range within schools. So, um, you know, some were, were classroom teachers, some were social workers, you know, uh, we have two on here who are specialists and being guidance counselors, like, you know, the whole, you know, range. Um, and so I think, um, 
if you see your organization is needing something like this, you should think about applying. Um, it is primarily geared towards schools, but it's, it, I would say even then, like CETA's worked really hard to make it broader to think about, you know, how you can bring equity and diversity to your institutions. Um, and while yes, most of them are connected to um, schools, not all of them are limited to that. And, it, and it's a wide range to like higher ed, private schools. So you've been doing a lot of work with Cara in the Brookline school system. It would be uh, just an idea of how many faculty members have gone through this program with you. Do you have any idea of the impact that, that this has had within our community? What did we, what was the last count, you guys? hundred. I think it was around 150. Yeah. Um, At the high school. Right. Which I would just say, you know, I, yeah, I know we have some people. Yeah. That's actually Brookline Public Schools getting off on the cheap. <laughs> Extreme cheap. So we, Which, so we, I mean, like, I, I don't mean that to say, like, you know, so listen, like, you know, in 2016, we brought in Dr. Beverly Tatum to speak to us for a day. You know, my father it was a contemporary doctor, but I know how much he cost to come for a day. That didn't, that cost was probably more than what it costs for Kara and I to go get trained and then to run seed sessions for a year. So, so the, you know, I think a lot of times, and there's a lot of people on here, they look at the sticker price and they say, oh my gosh, it's that much to go get trained. And, you know, Kara and I, you know, they didn't have it in Massachusetts when Kara and I did it. So we went to Wisconsin. So, you know, plane ticket, whatever. But the reality was like the BEF grant plus the little money we had to throw it. I, I tell you right now, I know it was cheaper than Dr. Beverly Tatum coming and talking to the district for a day. And so- yeah. You know, and, and, and we it's 10 yeah. months, right? right? Like it's, it's this really, really deep work. It's not like a workshop that you go to and you listen to somebody talk about what you should do, how you should be, the things you should learn. It's a 10 month process and each month is three hours of deep, deep work. So, um, Great. It's, yeah, it's, that's a huge yeah. return on investment right there. Huge. <laughs> and then just to add in uh, elementary, I would say we've uh, probably trained, uh, had 55 people over the three years in, in our sessions. Um, and I just have to add this one thing that we do a survey at the end of the year. And so from the words of, I collected some of the quotes of what teachers said. And one, and one teacher said, um, it's been critical to do this work as opposed to anything academic. I really am a changed person and that will impact my students more than any course on pedagogy that I could ever take. And I think that's, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. It speaks for itself right there. Right. So I want to, we do have to uh, check on time. It's 829. I do want to just end with uh, a question about how quickly, if you could each just go through and we'll go through the list of how you think, speak a little bit about the impact that you've noticed that it, this program and, and the work that you've done with over 200 faculty members on students. Um, do, do you, have you seen an impact and can you give one example of, of where you've seen that? And let's start with Hillary on this, this question. So as a math specialist, I see it less on a day-to-day -day basis with students than what I see faculty doing. You know, my role is I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging faculty to take on different roles in our building. And I have seen teachers begin um, monthly meetings to be talking about equity and diversity in our building so that they can impact what's happening in their classrooms. I see them, you know, creating meetings with our principal to sort of look at policies that we have in the building to change how our policies affect students. So I'm seeing that that teachers are taking on leadership roles to make greater change and um, move things along with their students. So I'm seeing it more on a teacher level than I am directly with the student level because that's my role in the building. Maybe somebody else. Okay, we, we are at 8.30, but we're gonna continue the conversation. So whoever wants to stay, because I really wanna understand the impact on students and, and just let everyone kind of give their perspective. Um, how about Julie, do you wanna go next? Sure, and again, I, in particular with my role as a district 
worldwide specialist, my access to children is fairly limited. And so I hear more about it from teachers who have, have taken the, the class. And recently um, a teacher reached out to me to talk about, to, and just to, to thank us for the, the work of SEED because um, you know, she said during this year in terms of both the pandemic and um, you know, um, dealing with uh, Black Lives Matter protests and different things that she had a facility to have conversations in her classroom with her students that she could never have imagined herself being able to have before she had participated in SEED and just her um, her ability to sort of normalize being able to have these difficult conversations and her, her trust in herself to be able to manage them to understand the language and, and um, to believe that you know young children can really grapple with these ideas. Lindsay, do you wanna? So I think going back to what I started in the beginning of the day of dialogue and asking for courage, um, on those days now, there's now a debrief day, the day after, and now kind of doubling down on what Malcolm said about resources, now at the high school there are over a hundred teachers who feel empowered to hold that debrief and to hold that space in a way that they couldn't before. Um, and I think also just in terms of resources, like it's majority white at the high school, we now have a resource of like white folks stepping up and trying harder. And also like, I can now, like, I know Kara's like, instead of always leaning on Malcolm, now I can go to Kara with a problem be like, okay, white woman to white woman, like here's an issue. And I know that that's happening because I do that to Kara. So I know my students are being better served because I'm coming back to conversations. And I'll say in class, like, yesterday, this is why this was wrong. And this is what I want to now try to do better. And people come to me and people come to the people in my seed group. And people will say, like, this is what I'm going to do for the asking for courage debrief. Or people will say, like, this is happening in my class and I want to go back to it. So students are being served better because teachers are engaging with them in more difficult ways and feeling empowered to do that, even when they mess up. I think before we used to be like trying to not make mistakes and now more people are recognizing the mistake and then doing something about it. Great, that's, that's so it's a much more two-way kind of respectful conversation, which I think is what, what helps the conversation move forward. Cara, Malcolm, do you have any comments on the impacts of students? Do you wanna add anything there? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the mind blowing moments, there were many in my new Seed Leaders Week was the learning about the concept of you don't know what you don't know. We call it DKDKs. And that just like my mind exploded. It continues to explode. You might be seeing a little bit of my brain coming out of the back here. But um, that's really what I apply. Uh, I apply DKDK in my job every day. Um, but also in my in my personal life. So it, it makes me ask questions because how do you figure out what you don't know without being curious? Uh, Lindsay talked about curiosity earlier. And so you really got to be curious. You got to go deeper. You got to go beyond the surface with, with any anything, anyone, um, but especially our kids. And when they see us doing that, they are affirmed, their existence is affirmed. And that is incredibly powerful uh, and doesn't happen enough, but we're getting there. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's, that's how I've been using it in my, my everyday life and it works. Great, Malcolm. I, I would just add, I think it's um, been much more apparent to me in uh, the shift to my job as MECA coordinator. Um, as I watch my micro kids, which who are, you know, primarily black and brown, um, we always have some Asian students. We have kids who identify as perhaps white, but also Latinx or Hispanic and things like that. But you know, they're almost all kids of color. And and you know, when when they talk about you know being seen in the curriculum and how teachers engage with them and things like that, I, you know, I. I can, I can almost immediately tell whether they've been C trained or not. Um, and, and, you know, it's not that, you know, they're, you know, 
it's not that there weren't teachers who did this before we started doing C training at Brooklyn High School. So there's, you know, there's other teachers there, but like, um, it's the way they ask questions, it's the way they process, it's the way they look at the world. Um, and, and I can see with my Meco kids, and I would say, I can also see when somebody isn't C trained and when teachers aren't truly seeing them for, you know, who they are and what they bring. Um, and so, I, yeah, it's just, it's, it, you know, it's had a really profound impact on my work with, with the kids um, to, you know, help usher through Brookline High because, you know, I, it's the kids are pretty forward about who they feel comfortable going to by themselves and who they don't and who they need me to actually interact and run interference for. So I think, um, yeah, that, that's been a really profound thing that happened since I started C training. So in the last five years, essentially, it's, it's a mock change. Well, for me, the, the, the last two years, oh. I, like the move from a classroom teacher where it was hard yeah. for me to always kind of know to somebody who oversees a group of kids as they navigate Brookline High. It's just been really you know, profound. Well, we, ha we do have a number of other questions, but we're actually out of time and I don't, I wanna respect people's evenings. Some people may be having to deal with homework and bedtime and dinner. So I wanna close by um, just uh, thanking everybody for coming um, this evening and um, if you want to learn more about the Brookline Education uh, Foundation, there's a link here, as well as the National Seed Project. A number of you had questions in addition. And any questions that we didn't get to um, during the session, we will type them up and have the panel respond and, and we'll follow up with those responses uh, as a follow up. This session has also been recorded and we'll send a link to those of you who would like to watch it again or share it with anyone that you know that might be interested that couldn't make it tonight. Um, and I want to thank Kara, Malcolm, Julie, Lindsay, Hillary um, for uh, and, and Lindsay, sorry, and Lindsay as well for coming tonight and giving your insight. It was really interesting to hear all your different perspectives of where you are in the process and where we think uh, we need to go. Um, and uh, please look out for an invitation to the next in this series of uh, webinars that we're planning on conducting uh, for the rest of this year on equity and education. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, BEF. We, we couldn't have done it without you. And thank you, Peggy. It's so exciting that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you oh. for giving us a chance to talk about seed it was great to be with everyone here who has been doing this work so well, thank, thank you, you for, this for, opportunity. For, for doing what you're doing too and yeah. educating and helping our kids through this process yeah, yeah. Have a thank good you on all of that. Yeah, Bye. thanks for you shout out emily style on here too that's that's huge. <laughs> you know, Peggy and Emily. Yours. Peggy and Emily, man. That, you, you know, you don't get more seed than that. Let me just say. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.